Last week, we talked about how Jesus sent out his apostles, his disciples, and his followers to do the work that he had done. And we saw that that included everything, the super spiritual, impressive, spooky stuff, and the very normal dealing with people stuff. But he went back to heaven, and we are his body here on earth, so we're the ones that are supposed to be doing what he did. In Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 4, let's see, is it going to go? Here we go. Hey, there, blue, that's good. In Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul tells us, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. Who, where is Christ's body? We are Christ's body. The church all over the world is Christ's body. That's why he equipped us to do the work, because when he was here on earth, he was one person in one place at one time. Now his body is covering the world everywhere all the time. People have more access. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, which means speak God's words, speak out as much, with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encouragement, enc be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. That's what we ended last week with. Now, we've spent several weeks learning about what God says about us. Learning about who God says we are. Well, God says we're his children. We've been learning about what he says we have. Well, we have unity with him. We have complete forgiveness. We have right standing in his sight. We have acceptance. And we have the right to rest in what Jesus has done for us. And we've learned that he's put us in this time and this place because there's something he wants us to do. He has blessed us with everything we'll ever need to live the life that he created us to live. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Please, God, bless us more. Guess what? He can't. You can't ask God to do something that he's already done. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. There are no more. It's already happened. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we're united with Jesus. Well, if Jesus has it, so do we. Because we're united with Jesus. The house I live in, I don't own. Rhonda and I own it. Well, actually, the mortgage company still owns the paper. But we've been making payments for almost 17 years. If I own it, Rhonda owns it. If Rhonda owns it, 
I own it because we're united in marriage. That means Rhonda has a very impressive collection of Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> if Jesus has it, you have it. That's pretty impressive. Now, in 2 Peter verse 1, or chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter says, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, Jesus. The best invitation we ever received. If you ever don't feel equipped, someone's lying to you. Because everything it takes to live the life that God created you to live has already been given to you. In verse four, Peter goes on, we were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you, your tickets to participation in the life of God. I keep saying this, folks, God is busy whether we participate or not. The question is, do we want to be involved? And boy, I do. We were given tickets to participate in the life of God after we turned our backs on a world concerned by human or corrupted by human desires. Because of Jesus, we have everything we need. Because of Jesus, we've got every spiritual blessing. Because of Jesus, we have free tickets to participate in what God is doing. There are people who would rather sit around and complain about how unfair life is. They choose to be victims. Why? Because they have tickets to participate. They're just not using them. the gifts that God has given us are almost mind-boggling. So my question is, how do we know if we really understand and really believe what God is telling us? Everybody can understand what we just talked about. The question is, do we really believe it? There are lots of things that we know But I've found out that what determines whether or not I actually believe it is how I behave. If if there was no other reason for this to happen, it's because it's been a great story for well over 30 years. We came in here one Sunday at church and we used to have different chairs in here. And they were this wonderful, bright yellow upholstered color. Do you remember those, Margie? It was the 1970s when those chairs were designed. And in the late 80s, we had them all reupholstered. Now, the lady who helped us reupholster them took a chair took the pieces out, made a template from those pieces, and cut new plywood for 700 chairs, and had them all upholstered. What she didn't know was that there were two types of chairs in the sanctuary, and they were different sizes. And the template that she had used was too small for half the chairs. Now, to do the job the correct way, you would make new templates. To do the job the incorrect way, you would just use longer screws and bend the frames of the chairs. We had longer screws and bent chair frames. Now, if you work with wood or anything like that, you know that that may work for a little while, right, Todd? But eventually, it's coming apart. 
And after a few weeks, the screws started pulling out of a lot of those pieces of wood and they'd get loose. And after a few more weeks, there were half the chairs in here that were just sitting together, but they were not being held together. And one of them was right over there. And one of the kids in our youth group came in and sat down for church and the song service was going, we're all standing up clapping. And the song service ended and Pastor Ron got up to start preaching. And this young man, whose name was Tyson, sat down in his chair. Now Tyson was a smallish guy. And he sat down in his chair. And have you noticed that most of the time when you sit down, you don't just sit, you sit and then you scoot a little bit? I'm not sure why. But you sit and then you scoot. Well, Tyson sat down and scooted. The seat of his chair was not being held on by screws anymore. It slid, flipped up, Tyson fell through the chair. We're in church and one of our youth group kids is in the chair with his head and arms sticking up like this and his feet sticking up in front of his face. I was the youth pastor. My first job was not to get Tyson out of the chair. It was to keep all the rest of the kids from laughing. I failed. So we got up, we helped pull Tyson out of the chair. Two thirds of the church was annoyed that we were being disruptive. One third of the church had seen what happened and they were being disruptive as well. Because it was funny. Well, I noticed the next week Tyson came into church and he walked up to his chair and he put his Bible down and then he grabbed the seat in the backrest of the chair and shook them. He'd never done that before. The reason he'd never done it before is he believed that the chair would hold him up. Now, he suspected the chair would hold him up, but he did not believe it. His belief changed his behavior. The entire rest of the time he went to church here, he checked his chair to make sure it would hold him up. What tells you whether or not you really believe something? It's how you behave. It's how you behave when you're not thinking about it. My guess is that at some point in time, every one of us in here who drives has gotten into the car, put the key in the ignition, turned the key, and heard... <coughs> got a battery that's not enough to start the car. It happens. Batteries wear out. I've heard people say, it's the devil trying to... No, it's not. Your battery wore out. Now, the funny thing is, you go down to the store, you get a new battery, put it in, the car starts up fine. The next day you get in the car and you put the key in and you hope it starts. But you don't know for sure that it's going to. And your hesitation is behavior that has changed. Have you ever stuck your hand under a faucet of water and the water's hot? Stick your hand under there, yank it back out. Ooh, that's hot. Now, the funny thing is you can turn off the hot water, turn on the cold water, and stick your hand back under. But if you're like me, you still jerk your hand out, even if the water's not hot. Because my beliefs determine my behavior. How do you know whether or not you really believe this stuff that God says about you? Well, of course I do. God says it. We've got to look at our behavior. We've got to live the life God wants us to live. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus is talking to his disciples before he goes up to heaven again. And he says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. 
Now, there's one thing I want to say that is going to, it's very easy to misunderstand. In John 3.16, we're told that God loved the world so much. And so we assume that we as followers of Jesus have to love everyone in the world. You know what? You can't. You will never meet the vast, vast, vast majority of people in this world. What we're going to find out today is we're told to love each other. We're told to love the people in our lives, the people we come in contact with. Jesus says, love each other just like I've loved you. You should love each other. The Apostle Paul added a little detail to this. In Romans 13, verse 8, he says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. Oh, we don't like that word. (laughs) Obligation. But we have an obligation as followers of Jesus to love each other. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirement of God's law. The commandments say, you must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have to worry about the other stuff. If you love people. I remember talking about all 613 rules in the Old Testament. The funny thing is, all 613 of them are covered under love each other. Verse 10 goes on, love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. Now, there are lots of different directions we could go. Why would love fulfill the requirements of God's law? Well, the Apostle John tells us that God is love. God doesn't just love people. God is love. And if we love each other, we are acting like God. Everything God wants is summed up in loving each other. Now, the question is, Could it really be that simple? So many people see God as angry, distant, constantly demanding, but never being satisfied because his standards are so unreasonably high. They see him as a supreme being that does his best to control us and keep us from doing what we want to do. Is that God? It's not the God that I read about in the New Testament. It's not the God that Jesus tells us about. The God that we've been reading about has given us every spiritual blessing. He's given us everything that we need to live the life he created us to live. He invites us into his presence. He accepts us fully. There is nothing between us and God. He has forgiven us absolutely. Yet people see him as angry, distant, and impossible to satisfy. It tells me that most people that I've met do not understand what we've been learning. Let's look at what Jesus himself says. This is a situation where the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, were trying to trick Jesus into saying something that they could use to get him in trouble. In other words, the Pharisees were journalists. (laughs) Every interview you see on TV is somebody trying to get a person to say something that will get them in trouble. 
That's what the Pharisees were trying to do. It says in Mark 12, verse 28, you can also read this in Matthew chapter 22, Luke chapter 10. It says, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. Can you imagine playing Jeopardy with Jesus? <laughs> These poor religious leaders are debating with Jesus. They're debating the nature of Scripture with the living Scripture. These guys were really, really intelligent idiots. <laughs> this Pharisee realized Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? There is no way to answer that correctly. Because all of the commandments came from God. Well, he thinks there's no way to answer it correctly. In verse 29, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Anyone, or, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You have got to love God with everything in you. And you've got to love everything about God more than anything about anything else. Not that the standard's set high or anything. You know that no one has ever done this but Jesus. But these are the people who wanted God to set up a system of rules so they could earn their way to heaven. Rule number one, and not a single person ever did it. But then Jesus says, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. This is funny. The teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and with all my understanding, with all my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than all the other burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. This is cool. Jesus, realizing how much the man understood, said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now the man didn't understand that the kingdom of God was right there. But not all the Pharisees are bad guys. Some of them are just a little mistaken. And they've been raised in a system that says you have to earn this. And then Jesus comes around and says, sorry, can't earn it. But I'll give it to you for free. It says, and after that, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. <laughs> you can't win. I know, let's take on Jesus in Bible trivia. <laughs> the kids in my youth group used to have Bible drills where I'd just throw references out and the first person to get it would stand up and if they could read the right verse, I'd give them a starburst or something. April Martinez in the back was the all-time champion in my youth group. <laughs> and this was before computers. Can you imagine trying to have a Bible drill with Jesus? They finally learned. Loving God is important. But Jesus said that loving the people around us, are you ready for this? Is just as important. He said, 
the other commandment is equally as important. To me, that means that loving God with everything in us and loving the people he put around us are the same thing. That might take a little bit of time to wrap our heads around. Because of the work that Jesus has done, the work that he finished on the cross, we've been released from the burden of trying to earn our way to God. We've been given every spiritual blessing that we would ever need to live this life God has given us. Now, I don't know that we can ever completely comprehend that. It might be a little beyond me, but I'm going to try. And I'm going to keep looking at how I live to see whether or not I really believe this. When something happens that I wasn't expecting, how do I react? Oh, God, why did you let this happen? That's not the correct reaction. Oh, but God, we need this, 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 and this. That tells me I'm looking at my need, not at the God that's meeting my need. See, my reaction tells me a lot. Look at what the Apostle Paul says about the lives we're supposed to be living. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, Paul says, For you have been called to live in freedom. We like freedom. Every one of us wants freedom. We just don't necessarily want other people to have freedom. We want to be free to do what we want to do, And we want them to be free to do what we want to do. (laughs) Yesterday, Wendy and I went down to San Clemente. And we met my brother and his daughter down there. And my mom and dad came down. And great uncle Bob's stepkids were there. And we had a great family lunch. And then Wendy interviewed Uncle Bob, about what it was like to grow up during the Depression and to be in World War II. The folks that experience that are getting fewer and fewer. Bob was showing us an article that had come out in the paper about the five World War II vets in San Clemente who were over 100. Bob is 103. He's the oldest one. And he said, two of them are 100 years old. And I said, kids. (laughs) When we got down to San Clemente, Bob lives a block from the beach and there's nothing between his house and the beach except a park. He's got a view that I could get used to. In fact, I was looking at it and I thought, I could live here for 40 years and not get tired of that. But we were down there on a Saturday afternoon. Guess what comes in short supply? Parking. And we pulled up and there was a spot right in front of his house. And I pulled in and parked there. And then Wendy and I had a long debate over whether or not it was a spot that required a parking meter. And that was not something that I wanted to test out by getting a ticket. But we put a quarter in the parking meter and it got us 10 minutes We were there for four and a half hours. And I kept looking and the parking meter was not right next to it and the sign was in front of my car and I thought, no, that's not a parking meter space. And then Uncle Bob's stepson, Steve, got there and he goes, no, no, that's not. I park there all the time. So I left my car there. It was really kind of nice. I'm not sure why I told that story. (laughs) There was a brilliant point there somewhere. (laughs) 
And just so you know, I don't have stories in my notes. Maybe it was the fact that God even gives you the stuff that you need to do the stuff he wants you to do. Last week, Wendy got very theological with us and explained to us how God even cares when you're having a bad hair day. And I laughed because I know a lot of people who would love to have a hair day. That's what it was. I wanted to have the freedom to be able to park where I wanted to park. I just didn't want the other bozos in San Clemente to take that spot. They didn't. They, you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. We have been given freedom and God wants us to use it to serve each other. Yeah, we better go on. In verse 14, Paul says, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. What if we treated people the way we would like to be treated? This Bible stuff isn't always complicated. Our freedom is so that we are free to treat each other the way we want to be treated. Let's see. Verse 15 says, but if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. In other words, avoid the internet. (laughs) Or just follow Steve Goodrich. There are some of us on social media who have just taken to doing dumb jokes. It's hard to get offended by a dumb joke. I don't even put blonde jokes up. By the way, you know why blonde jokes are usually one-liners? so the brunettes can understand them. (laughs) We better go on. Verse 16 says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. How do you know if the Holy Spirit is guiding your life? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? That's what the Holy Spirit will guide you to do. Are you fighting with other people? Are you getting in arguments all the time? Are you upset at what people are doing? I get that. But you can't be like that and having the Holy Spirit guide your life. See, this is where I wish it was more complicated. But it's not. It's actually simple. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. I remember how disappointed I was when it occurred to me that that little voice in the back of my head that says, are you going to let them say that to you? Was not God. (laughs) That little voice in my head that says, don't they know who you are? That wasn't God. That 
urge inside of me that says someone on the internet is wrong and I must fix them. (laughs) That's not God. I've been trying to fix people for years and they still like country music. It was child abuse, I tell you. (laughs) Every Saturday afternoon, (laughs) hee-haw. I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be trying to do what your sin nature wants you to. Now it's time to cut to the chase here. Loving God is expressed by loving the people he's put around us. You cannot legitimately say, I love God. And these losers around me ought to follow my example. (laughs) I love God. And these pathetic people I love God enough to stay here even though they're all idiots. Loving God is expressed by loving the people he has put around us. It doesn't matter how good you look in church. It doesn't matter what kind of language you use when other people are listening. It doesn't matter how spiritual you sound. It's whether or not we love people that says how much we love God. A moment ago, we read what Jesus said to his followers in John 13, 34. Remember this? So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Let's let him finish the thought. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Interesting question. How would the world know whether or not you follow Jesus? Well, of course they know. I have the correct bumper sticker on my car. Of course they know. I have my official Christian TV Christmas ornament on the front door of my house all year. Of course they know. Don't they hear the words that I use? So how you doing today? Blessed. If you're a little younger, how would they know? Well, look at the clever and creative Christian t-shirt I'm wearing. And this is coming from a guy who actually has a couple of Christian Hawaiian shirts. Jesus said, how will the world know you're my followers? Because you love each other. I don't think we can overstate the importance of loving the people around us. And it does no good to tell people what a great Christian you are if you're not loving the people around you. You can't argue with them and tell them that God's not angry and all that stuff if you're not treating them well. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, as people who've put their trust, who've put their faith in Jesus, our defining characteristic to the rest of the world is supposed to be our love for one another. The older I get, the more obvious it is to me that our world does not have an abundance of love. 
and people are not used to being treated that way. In a couple of weeks, we're going to start closing in on the holiday season. And there will be stories on the news about how to get through Thanksgiving dinner without actually killing someone. (laughs) And then there will be stories on the news to talk about how harmful holidays like Thanksgiving are because not everyone has a loving family. And then Christmas. Don't you know that there are more suicides during Christmas than other times of the year? That may or may not be true. It didn't seem to stop people from shutting down our country. Have you been following what's been happening to the suicide rates in the last seven months? There is not an abundance of love in this world. It's hard to watch TV without watching a staged argument. You can't even watch a home decorating show without watching a staged argument. Got to keep the drama up. No, folks, our love for one another will show that we're Jesus followers. That should be our defining characteristic. And if it is, I tell you, people will notice. We've got people coming on this campus every day who tell us it feels different when they cross through that gate. It feels different here because my Bethel family loves people. I hear the stories often about, I came here and all these people were nice to me. I haven't had people be nice to me that weren't trying to sell me a car in a long time. (laughs) It's something that Bethel does because we follow Jesus. That doesn't mean we can't do it more though. There are a lot of folks who need the touch of the love of Jesus. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to love people? What does love mean? And my guess is a lot of what we think love is, is not accurate. But if we study what the Bible tells us about love, we will continue to have an increasing effect on the people around us. And I'm looking forward to that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for everybody who snuck in here today and everybody who's watching on the live stream. We know beyond a shadow of doubt that you love each one of us more than we can possibly understand. But Father, I'm asking for help so that we can show the people in our lives, the people that we live near, the people in our city and in our community, how much we love them because they're important to you. Help us love our neighbors. Help us know what to say, when to say it, when to offer assistance, when to invite them to church. Help us bring them to a place that is so loving, it's obvious to people when they step on this campus. Father, we simply want to reach the people that you have put around us in our lives. Now this coming week, Father, whatever you have for us to do, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, we thank you that you are with us. You have equipped us, you have blessed us, and we are capable of doing what you want us to do. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name.